Ever since stepping into a managerial role, I found that I'm thinking a lot more about the future. I'm thinking a lot more about kind of the more grand scheme of things, especially when it comes to the developer experience. So I'm thinking, um, where do we want to be, say, a year from now, five years from now? How do we want the documentation to look? How do we want people to navigate through it? And what kind of story are we wanting to tell um, as they're moving through? How are we presenting use cases in the most useful way possible to our audience? When you have external documentation, you have much more of an audience eye than the writer's eye. So they're more prone to find maybe gaps in the documentation and also be very vocal about what they feel is missing and what they would like to see. So that's the kind of feedback that we're getting right now, in addition to maybe more of the minor kind of like grammatical things that um, slip through every once in a while. Welcome. Today's guest is Uvana Ikaidi. She's Developer Documentation Manager at BigCommerce. She's been a technical writer for almost 10 years and works now predominantly with API documentation. She's extremely passionate about every aspect of the documentation lifecycle. And Uvana works to break down silos and to collaborate cross-functionally to create truly valuable developer documentation. Hello, Uvana, and hi, Annette. Hi, Lara. Hello. How are you? We're good, thank you. Yeah, and you? I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> so you were a developer documentation specialist at e-commerce when you started, and now you are developer documentation manager. Can you tell us about your current role and what are your responsibilities? What is beyond the user scope of what a technical writer does? Yeah, that was a uh, very exciting for me being able to move from kind of a more individual contributor position as a writer and then move on to more of a management position. And I would say that the main difference I found has been in what um, space of time you're operating in and thinking in most of the time. I'd say that as an individual contributor, it's more of a day-to-day -day contributions and you're thinking about what projects are we working on right now, what deliverables do we need to produce, that kind of thing. But ever since stepping into a managerial role, I found that I'm thinking a lot more about the future. I'm thinking a lot more about kind of the more grand scheme of things, especially when it comes to the developer experience. So I'm thinking, um, where do we want to be, say, a year from now, five years from now? How do we want the documentation to look? How do we want people to navigate through it? And what kind of story are we wanting to tell um, as they're moving through? How are we presenting use cases in the most useful way possible to our audience? So I would say that's the main difference between um, being a developer documentation writer and a manager. And which one you prefer? Ooh. Or can you say it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would say that it's a bit of a it's it's a bit of both. There are aspects of both that I like. I would definitely would say that from a managerial standpoint, I like being able to think future term because I like being able to have conversations, not just within my team but within other teams about how, what do we want our developer experience to look like down the road and what steps can we take kind of thinking backwards saying, this is where we want to end up. So what steps can we be taking to get us there? And how can we, how can we figure out if we're getting there, if we're making progress and all things having to do with that. On the other hand, I do find that I'm writing less and less now, which is something that I miss, especially because writing was really what got me into um, becoming a technical writer in the first place. I would say that the um, consolation is that I'm still constantly learning, which is a very important part of technical writing or developer documentation. So that's nice, but I do find that more and more of my time has gone into more of a planning mode so that leaves less and less time for 
writing proper. Is it because you don't have the capacity to write as a manager or because it is out of scope? Yeah, it's more of the latter. It's more out of scope. So mm -hmm. most of that, it's important for me to make sure that, especially because my team is relatively new, it's learning and it's burgeoning that I'm giving opportunities to my team to take on more of these project roles to write, to get more acquainted with our platform and more acquainted with the teams that they're going to be supporting when it comes to supporting a feature release or product release, anything like that. So there are times where I am able when everyone else is more, is wrapped up in a project and some mm -hmm. other project comes down the pipeline, I'll be able to take care of that. But in most cases, it's more of a scope thing where most of my time should be going towards planning. You write on LinkedIn that um, once a technical writer, you started immersing yourself also into programming because you have realized that actually many developer experience frictions can be solved on the level of code rather than trying to treat it as if it was a syndrome and add documentation to it. And uh, also you mentioned communication as a very effective medication for problems. When you have to assess the complexity of problems or aligning API design and documentation sprints, does your degree in biology come back? Yes, I would say so. I think more so in how I approach problems and clarify what it is our goals are. I would say that my background in biology and in medicine was a great way to bolster my more analytical thinking side. So I find myself defaulting to not so much uh, how are we going to do this or, or what are we doing? I very much want to know the why, because from my perspective, documentation is as much about what you are documenting as what you are consciously choosing not to document. So in a lot of cases, I find that being able to draw those boundaries from the beginning and have discussions, figuring out why it is that we're documenting something and what we want our audience to get out of it is a great way to prevent there being a bit of a dissonance between teams down the line because we have sat down and we've established what do we want the documentation to do what it is capable of doing, and in some cases, what it's not capable of doing. So some, in some cases, this can manifest as that there are things that the feature just can't do, or there are some ways that the feature needs to be improved, and using documentation to kind of write around that can be a temporary solution but it's not something that we should be defaulting to and using as a crutch time after time after time. Yeah. It's kind of like when you translate, the fault lines come out. If there's anything that is a limitation or a constraint, when you try to translate between audiences, it really easily comes out like, oh, this is where the line in the sand is. If we want to move it, there it is. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And there's also such a thing like too much information. I've been very busy recently about that too much information. Well, I think most of us since it's 2020 and lockdown and we have too much and not enough information at the same time. And, and collaboration has become also super important and more intentional, I would say, since the corridor happenings are often not, corridor meetings are often not happening. And we have some amazing tools, live offsync to work better and more efficiently in teams, across teams. And we're starting to see a new issue in business terms. Uh, I read it in the business book. It's called death by collaboration. Uh, and especially when you have to make a decision, it can sometimes be an issue. How do you navigate away from this? Because it has a pull like a black hole. And I assume that collaborating is one of the most important aspects of your, of your role. Absolutely. Yes. That reminds me, I think a, a different term that I hear around big commerce is a death by committee. So yes. Maybe too many cooks in the kitchen and everybody wants to contribute 
some kind of um, opinion or something like that, that can actually slow progress to a crawl. And you've gotten a situation where things get put on the back burner just because there hasn't been some kind of consensus as to what do we want to do? How do we want to move forward? So what I find to be a useful, I would say, guard against that has to do with really setting intentions and understanding whose opinion is most important for certain aspects of any given project. And I find that we're we're pretty good at that at good at big commerce because when we are planning to release a product or a feature, what we do is we have representatives from all different departments and we're able to sit down in a joint meeting. And that's where we usually learn about the uh, product uh, or feature that we're wanting to release. And upon learning about it, what we do is go around and find out, okay, for the department that you're in, what contributions would you like to make? Uh, what kind of steps do you feel need to be done before we release and make it generally available? And which of the departments do you need to work with, collaborate with, and coordinate with in order to make it so that there is as smooth as a release as possible? So with regards to that, by setting the roles and who needs to be reviewing, who needs to approve ahead of time, uh, that makes it a lot easier down the line because all of those major decisions have already been made. Um, everyone knows what they need to contribute to and in what capacity they need to contribute so that no one feels like they have to have an opinion about everything. There just needs to be opinions about what you're, you're a stakeholder in or what's going to affect your work the most. Um, and then in terms of approval, who are the ones who need to have eyes on something and need to approve it before anything goes out to become generally available. Mm -hmm. And the learning curve of what is the granularity of these steps, how is that for you? Mm. I mean, if you take too, too big a change, then things can move along the way compared to how you thought it should be in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that's true. The size of the change is going to be a major contributing factor here. I would say that the nice thing is usually that we're able to break these in, down into phases. So you begin with, okay, for the first phase, this is all of the work that needs to be completed. These are the decisions that need to be made. And in some cases, one phase is working in parallel while a second phase is moving along. Uh, in some cases, the first phase is a bit of a blocker, so everything needs to be in order before the second phase can begin. So I find that when we're working with a bit larger of projects, uh, this is the most efficient way because when we're breaking it down into a bit more of that granular um, task flow so we can understand what needs to be done by this specific date so that other things can happen. It allows for all of the stakeholders to have a better idea of not only what needs to be delivered, but what can feasibly be delivered in that time frame. I read in one of your articles that at BigCommerce you united your API reference documents and Stencil Team Docs under one united domain along with a weekly updated changelog, a feedback feature and a developer blog. What has noticeably changed since then? What are the results of this change? Mm -hmm. So I will say that the the meaning or the intent behind bringing all of these kind of disparate things under one domain was really for clarity and a bit of a unity of experience. So what we had found prior to us having all of these resources under one domain was that there was a lot of confusion as to where certain information uh, was concerning if that was about themes, if that was about APIs or where there were um, some crossover between these two, because some 
working with themes sometimes involves you needing to interact with specific APIs that we offer. Mm -hmm. So we found that that was a bit confusing for our audience. So that was one reason that we wanted to try and bring as much information under one domain as possible. So we found that markedly there's been fewer instances of confusion that come through um, our support because that's a lot of where we hear these questions about where is this, where can I find more information about this or that, it usually is coming through our support department. So there's been a market decrease in that. Um, in addition to that, we found that it is a lot easier to keep track of what the pathing of our visitors to our site looks like, just from an analytics standpoint, to see if uh, when you come in or you're landing on one page, what, um, what path are you taking through the documentation? Uh, how many times are you able to search and find what you're looking for? You know, what is the bounce rate on certain pages? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. That's a lot easier to monitor when everything is under uh, one domain. I wonder, do you have uh, only uh, publicly available documents or do you have some kind of access control applied? Yes. So... We do have some of our documentation um, publicly available. Um, that and most of the conceptual documentation that's available externally on our site is also available uh, on our public GitHub repo. And this is where we receive some of our feedback um, or recommendations for our documentation that in addition to the on-page feedback feature that we have, um, so that is one aspect for that. Um, in addition, I would say on the other side, in terms of documentation that isn't necessarily, that is more private, that is the API uh, specification files that we use to generate our um, API reference documentation. That is, or the documentation that we use and edit, that is actually uh, more private that sits in a private repos, um, still on GitHub. Uh, however, we do still provide those extensive um, spec files in our API reference. They're just uh, copies of what is generated. So those are available for download in our API reference section. Can we talk a bit about change logs? Because uh, we all know that they are so important, but uh... From my experience, it is really hard orchestrating all the different departments or teams of the company to have a nice change log. Mm -hmm. what, what, what one should have in a change log on a practical level? What do you suggest? Uh, in terms of getting, I guess, working with the different teams yeah. to unify, mm -hmm. I would say, hmm. That's a good question. For us, we don't necessarily operate that way. We actually have separate change logs that usually oh. come out on separate days for separate teams. Wow, and, because... and then do you fuse them or, or merge them? Uh, sometimes it does depend on the team. We were just talking about our themes, our theme documentation and updates to our themes. Those actually are change logs in and of themselves, just because it's a lot easier to tag and make uh, an audience aware of that these are specific changes that apply to you just because we find that our audience is a bit split. We have our developer audience that's working predominantly with our APIs, and then we have the portion of our developers that are more of theme developers. So any updates to our themes would be targeted at a certain audience as opposed to another. So we actually do have our theme documentation, or I'm sorry, our theme change log um, mm -hmm. that gets released on a different cadence from the rest of the change log. So when it comes to that, we work almost really directly with the themes team and 
for them, I say that I would say that their cadence is a bit more regular, whereas change logs that come from API is a little bit more sporadic. So those we mm-hmm. tend to group together into their own change log and release on a weekly basis, whereas the themes change log, we tend to see that update maybe every month or two. So whenever that happens, that gets released in its own change log update. You had an amazingly helpful and exhaustive presentation about internal and external feedback to documentation sets this past June at API The Docs conference. I would like to ask further from the last side on about your experience. How much contributions are you getting from the community? I'm really curious about that. And did you find ways to solicit the type of feedback you need? Mm -hmm. So the amount of feedback that we're getting from the community, I would say that it's, I don't know how I would necessarily compare it for against others, but for right now, I would say that we do have a constant stream to the point where we're addressing feedback uh, probably in every sprint that we're going through. Um, And I would say that right now it is a It is the type of feedback that you would expect at this point, just when you have external documentation, you have much more of an audience eye than the writer's eye. So they're more prone to find maybe gaps in the documentation and also be very vocal about what they feel is missing and what they would like to see. So that's the kind of feedback that we're getting right now, in addition to maybe more of the minor kind of like grammatical things that um, slip through every once in a while. So for me, that's been the most useful because we're getting feedback that talks about what kind of use cases um, our audience is going through, what kind of Uh, examples or maybe even code snippets they would like to see for specific use cases. And then we're able to communicate that alongside our developer relations team, depending on the size of the ask and how broadly applicable it is. If this is something that we're wanting to document inside of the external documentation in general, or if this is more of a niche case that would make a more suitable blog post, just so that the turnaround time is a bit quicker. Um, Or if it's something where we do have documentation in place right now that discusses it, but we didn't go maybe as far as we could. So we could be adding in an additional code snippet. We could be adding in an additional example that wouldn't be uh, too taxing or it wouldn't be too much of an information overload. So -hmm. that's really the three ways that we're taking the, the feedback that we're receiving. Just to see the bigger picture, uh, what kind of feedback options do users have? So you, uh, I already uh, read about this feedback feature on your Medium article, but what, how can a user interact and leave feedback? Yeah, so you've seen three main ways that we're receiving feedback, two direct and then one indirectly. Mm -hmm. So like you said, we have the feedback feature that's on each of our pages and the external documentation. We also have our GitHub repo, which is public. So we will receive uh, issues or recommendations in the form of issue requests from there as well. And in addition to that, we also get feedback from our documentation through the uh, support network because we do have our support department that gives help in terms of more developer focused questions. So in a lot of cases, we'll get feedback from support saying, oh, this is the kind of questions that we're receiving. Maybe this would be a good thing to document inside of our external documentation. And that's another place where we're needing to weigh, okay, is this something that's broadly applicable enough or have we received enough of a similar requests so that it should be in the proper documentation itself? Or is this something that we're going to lean a little bit more on developer relations to turn out something that is useful, but uh, a little bit more quick because it's more about a specific use case that we're not seeing broadly. That's a lot of feedback. <laughs> it is. Can you 
talk about you talked shortly in your presentation uh last june about how to triage and collect feedback but about the pitfalls that you learned along the way that wasn't clear from the get-go sort of like i assume there is such a thing as best intentions gone overwhelming oh, how yeah. mm -hmm. once you figure out finally how to get relevant feedback but then you have that and it's an avalanche what do you do then yeah, so that is something I feel like we're tackling right now. We're very happy to have all this feedback coming in. But when it comes to identifying what is helpful feedback, what is feedback that we can actually act on, that is another aspect, especially when we're getting feedback, not only from our external users, but a bit from our internal users as well, like in the form of recommendations. This is something that they would like to see documented because it kind of it helps their workflow a bit more. But we don't necessarily know that it's going to be as useful to our external audience that doesn't have the context of being within our organization. So when it comes to the external feedback, what we're focusing on changing right now is making sure that the types of questions that we're asking and the options that we provide when classifying the feedback that you're giving makes it so that you're able to filter the feedback that you're receiving effectively so that there can be some kind of action taken as a result of that feedback. Right now, it's a little bit of a free for all. So it's like if you have any kind of feedback, regardless of what it is, um, you have only to submit the feedback with a bit of a description and then we'll pull in the page that you're on and then we'll work from there. So there's a lot of work that's happening kind of on our side to make decisions like, okay, what kind of feedback is this? Is it more of just a grammatical thing? Is this something where the person just didn't like how this was positioned? Is this a situation where they're asking for information that is available, but maybe just isn't where they thought it would be, which speaks to organization, anything like that? Um, or is it something completely different where it's not necessarily that, necessarily that anything is missing in the documentation, but it's more of a recommendation saying, oh, I wish there would be something like this. Sometimes we're getting things like feature requests. It's like we understand that, the, that this is the information that you have, but I would want to see this also available. So determining and giving people a way to kind of filter and say, this is the kind of feedback that I'm giving you, allows us to get a better idea of how we're going to act on that feedback, if we're going to act on that feedback, and whether we're the right people, the, whether we're the right team to receive that feedback. Because when it comes to, um, like I was mentioning before, feature requests, that's not necessarily something for the documentation team, but might be useful for uh, the product and engineering team just to let them know that this is some of the feedback that we're receiving that we're receiving in terms of the product or the feature from our actual developer audience. And in your experience so far, how is the balance to ask people to self-select the category, the type of feedback they're giving, or that suddenly becomes the last drop in the cognitive load and ugh, don't bother me anymore. Where how do you balance this? Or is it even a good idea? To, to ask people to tag their requests themselves? So we haven't had a chance to test this out at Big Commerce, but- Yeah, I, I understood that, but it's like a lot of work behind the oh, scenes sure. if you have to do this yourselves. Oh yes, definitely. I know that at previous places that I've worked where we've, when we've given that option, that I hadn't, I didn't see a market decrease in mm -hmm. the amount of feedback that we we got, but I would say that initially when we were implementing it, the descriptions that we gave were not mm, as useful perhaps to the people who are giving the feedback mm -hmm. as would be helpful to them. So 
what we found was we we had a lot of people who were who were actively selecting or categorizing their feedback, but it wasn't in a way that we would necessarily classify it. So we saw a lot of uh, a little bit of dissonance between what we thought were certain types of feedback and what um, the audience thought was certain type of feedback. And how we got through that was by more more readily defining and more descriptively defining and giving more pointed examples of what we felt were each type. And honestly, to come up with uh, the best way to do this, we we worked cross-functionally with another team, I think with our with our data science team to get a bit more feedback and a bit of more consultation on how, what is the best way to talk about or describe the kind of feedback that we're wanting so that we're empowering our audience to communicate with us in the most efficient way possible. Wanna, do you have a message you want to leave the listener with? Yeah, I would say that when it comes to documentation, it is very easy to assume that the bulk of that work has to do with the writing. But I would say about 80% of that work is the preparation for that writing, and then 20% of it is the actual writing. And that 80% really has to do with talking with the right people, um, creating the best cross-functional relationships that you have. And what I think is the most important is making sure that as a documentation team, you are getting involved in discussions about the product feature, anything like that, really development as early as possible. Because when it comes, the further down in development a certain feature goes without documentation being aware of it, it becomes that much harder to explain because the silo has been created where only the people who know the most about it, and maybe in some cases, the only people who know how something works, whether that be on the front end or the back end, are the, is the team that developed it, it. So I would say that, yeah, it's a misconception to think that documentation is a, a solitary endeavor. It really takes an entire department and multiple departments to make it work. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Oh, thank, thank you, you for having me. <laughs> thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. You can reach us at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidedocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past presentations from the API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.